And hello, welcome to my talk. Spring Jakarta is CDI, the good parts this time. You will see. So I'm Jarek Kratajski. Yeah, work, I work as a software developer, uh, uh, partially a wizard, maybe more necromancer, keeping old applications uh, being alive, an architect, and I work at Ingenious GmbH in Switzerland. So uh, important thing as a background to this presentation, I work with Java E since about 2001, I've seen it before, but from this year, more or less started professionally to like use Java E. And with Spring, uh, uh, from about 2006, and I'm still doing something, I will, I will show. I still remember like uh, application server called EJB OSS, and that was uh, even the zero version of JBoss that you might have heard about. Uh, be, uh, at one moment when it became alive, uh, people from Sun, lawyers from Sun, forced Mark Flurry to change the name of the server. Hence, we have JBoss, in fact, uh, because EJB was reserved. And I still remember the books and actually the, the guides to Spring, were, which were saying that it's so great to separate all the stuff into XML and do not code in Java because that's that obviously ugly. So that, that was that times. Oh. Uh, even now, I'm working with, I think, more or less 15 Spring uh, and Java E projects. Uh, I'm mostly maintaining, so that's not that much active development, but I can keep my hands dirty. And I only, in fact, professionally work for a few Java projects uh, or JVM projects, which are not really Spring or Java E based. One of them is very critical, netly based application. That's a different story. So. Uh, Perspective about what I'm saying, it might be important. I, I in fact, like digging in a, yeah, problems in production bugs. I like solving them. So like every, every time, concurrency, security, performance, Heisenberg leaks. That's what sounds interesting to me, especially if it's not in my code. Well, it happens sometimes, but I do like to jump into someone else's code and discover what did happen here. Uh, also, I am greatly inspired by this book. I still remember this kind of a punch in the face I had. I don't know. Uh, that was almost 10 years ago when I've seen video, actually not the book, about uh, from uh, Robert Cecil Martin with uh, Clean Architecture um, the title and uh, the sentence that how did it even happen that we Java developers know that in the next project we'll use Spring this version and this database or Java E this version, and we not even ask the customer what has to be done. But I was this kind of developer back then. Uh, also important that uh, I am not um, any more senior developer. I was like senior developer maybe 10 years ago. Now I am just old developer. So for me, things like productivity, so doing something in three lines are not as much important as doing things that will stay there for years, will be able, will be able to refactor them, etc. So um, might be that my goals are a little bit different than many developers have. Uh, uh, so like safety, well, whenever uh, I see that something is a pitfall, I don't like the solution, but if something has pitfalls, if something is not easy to refactor, etc., etc. So in Java, when it comes to safety, I see, uh, and that's obviously no uh, surprise, that we have two powerful tools. One is type system, which help us to do a lot of, uh, to actually check a lot of constraints. And second are tests, obviously. Uh, typical pitfall that I, for instance, can name, and I really hate, uh, is like this kind of API when we have something like connection. And then we have, uh, we have a method read that's actually important from the business perspective. But before we call read, we always have to call init. That is a, uh, it's easy to put something in a documentation that you have to do. It's easy to put an exception if someone didn't do that. But even if it's like uh, very common and everyone knows it, sooner or later, someone will forget about this init, will be dropped during the uh, refactoring. And obviously there is like one good way to do it better to have something like initialized connection that is returned by init that only this type of object has a method read. So now compiler and type safety prevents you from this uh, problem, from, from unsafe refactoring. So 
My, I have, because of that, a little bit of problems, and actually for a few years with Java and, and Spring, because they are productive, uh, and but they, in, in, in fact, bring a little bit of harm to code and some really crazy pitfalls that I feel, see constantly are happening and people are following them on production. So, uh, by the way, the title might be a little bit misleading. That was intentional. Sorry if someone is feeling like cheated, uh, because I will be in fact bashing a lot of uh, Spring and Java E. Let's say that is kind of a run rant. So I'll be saying what is wrong. Uh, but in fact, I gave this title to myself to remember that actually my mission is not to just rant. I want to bring something positive and some value. So let's think about this talk that I will say what is wrong so that at the end you will know what is actually good, the things that are not mentioned. I will try at the end to summarize them. Okay. So uh, basically, yeah, I'm talking about bad things, but, and, but uh, in order to see what's actually you have to avoid and what kind of alternatives do you have. 10 years ago, if I was doing this talk, I would tell you, and I was, if I was doing this talk, exactly my mission, mission statement, like uh, whatever, would be read more books. You have to be careful when you use, use Java E or Spring, just read those books. I still remember when I was, uh, whenever I was seeing some kind of a problem typical to Spring that someone is spending hours to resolve, uh, I was saying, oh, come on, you should have read that book, then you would know what, what, what is to be done. Uh, the problem is people actually never read books, and uh, even 10 years ago, they were rarely uh, reading books. And uh, during those years, I realized there are frameworks uh, that do not uh, have that many pitfalls and do not force you to read that much. So you can actually avoid, avoid overloading your memory with tons of you know, small tricks you have to remember. Okay, my first big part and the biggest of this presentation is about beans which I do hate with passions, passion. What is a bean? I don't mean Java beans. I think this is a kind of a closed topic. We don't do that anymore. Maybe some of you do, uh, but please don't do getters and setters, uh, at least not that many. If you don't have to, it's 2020. I'm talking about spring beans, Java E beans, whatever, JSF beans, JPA, because all of them have some things in common. Yeah, bean is, looks like an object in Java. The class of bin looks like a normal class, but actually it is not. It, for instance, one very distinctive uh, feature is you do not instantiate bins by new. You can, but it will typically lead to a failure. So, and apart from that, the crazy or sometimes not crazy, but there are rules, limitations, and conventional use. There are some things you do with a bean or you do not. Uh, some of them I will mention later. So, but you have to be careful. Already this is smelly for me. Now we have pitfalls. So the first thing is, why do we even have those beans? Like we have in almost all these leading Java frameworks, we have beans. And I know the answer. The answer is because all you love injections. Uh, all you love dependency injection. But if you go to the dependency injection definition as a pattern, I will sp spare this time reading that, you will see this very important statement there. It's passing the service to the client rather than allowing client to build and find a service. That is a fundamental requirement of this pattern. What does it mean? Basically, the pattern says nothing about beans, containers that will instantiate the classes, objects for you, for you. So like, so uh, how do we know we have a dependency injection? For, for instance, here is an obvious presentation of something that where we don't have dependency injection. This, this is, for instance, hard to test if you want to test it with some, for instance, different database in memory database, like this kind of service. If we created the service in a way that it has a constructor with DB repository, then we, in the other part of the code, can create this repository, maybe this time for, in, for tests in memory, DB repository, something like that. And then we can create a service passing to the constructor the dependency. And that is exactly the 
how we can do dependency injection in Java since Java version 1.0, that was already having constructors to classes, really. And by the way, there's even a little bit longer blog, um, again by Uncle Bob, uh, about exactly this, that you don't need any special framework, it's just Java that you need. And by the way, in uh, functional languages, we have some other patterns, not on the constructors. Okay, but it's, it's Java-centric talk right now, so let's concentrate on this. So how do we use then our containers, our sophisticated tools that uh, create all these graphs of beans for us? Because those let us inject with a very small cost. And so what I say, in fact, at a very small cost, we can create a big technical debt. We sol sol solve a small problem we have now, but the, there is something to be paid later because what will happen, you know, is a spaghetti. It's a different spaghetti than with GoTo, uh, but it is like you inject, you can potentially inject everything everywhere. And that's exactly like GoTo. I like this part, in fact. So, uh, Repository in controller, you want to inject, you can do that. Uh, HTTP request, request in persistence layer, why not? You can do that. That's all, let's say, the most crazy uh, things, but actually this is typically more sophisticated on an architectural level, like uh, different kinds of services that should not actually be talking together, but you inject, and I see that. Uh, obviously, you would say that only bad developers create such a mess, such a spaghetti. But I know the reality because I jump into such projects and I know what's happening. Exactly, by the way, this kind of statement was always given by people uh, supporting GoTo. Like if you are a good developer, you know what to do with GoTo, you will use it on the safe place, in safe places. But if you are bad developers, anyhow, there is no help for you. Uh, somehow we dropped using GoTo, yeah? So, I know the reality because I've seen that many times, sooner or later, there is a demo to be done an hour before, you have to patch your project so that it's working and then all these crazy things happen. This, all these bad injections will happen and will be stayed, stayed there forever. Uh, by the way, because I know that in Agile and Scrum, especially the most important things are, you know, nice velocity and great, good looking burn down charts. Everyone know, learns that. So you can sacrifice a lot in order to have that. Uh, I even use small metric. Uh, I call a level of beans obscurity. I just count, I look for classes when I join a project which have the most uh, annotations, the most, uh, the mo not only annotations, but injections, dependencies. And uh, in a projects that actually are looking good, typical metric is like 18, 15, 20, so which exactly the, uh, classes with so many dependencies, so many injections. Obviously something went wrong for those classes. And I say projects that seem to be actually, mm, how to say that, created by reasonable people that really cared. I've heard about the projects that had like hundreds of dependency in one class. Something obviously went wrong. And uh, that's sometimes even funny because that became an argument why we should, we need uh, in fact, a container because otherwise, you know, creating class with 18 de dependencies is a mess because you have to write so many parameters to the constructor. Yeah, obviously. Uh, is there any solution to that? Yes, solution is actually uh, feasible in a few steps. And that's, let's say, for those that you don't know about it, never ever write code like this with field based dependency, field based injections. This is begging for null pointer exception to happen. That was summarized by Oliver Gierke. By the way, one of the uh, very important um, uh, committers of Spring, like uh, uh, he's responsible to the great part of Spring data. And he even has a big blog post why you should always switch to a constructor injection if you can. The next step is actually still you don't have to even forget about Spring, you can do it that in Spring, you don't actually have to write these annotations. So your code then will be actually clean from any uh, dependencies to the Spring jars. Yeah. 
and still will work as a bin. That's not a big difference. Uh, just if maybe if you are, that's like migration steps. And finally, this is what you can try and you can try it on a small scale. You doesn't mean that you have to go full way. I will mention that later. You can do this. Like I have class A and just a normal class. That's, that's class that's not and bin anymore. And then I have somewhere something like a serve configuration that's actually a provider of this class. And maybe I have the more methods and this is not a full code when I created this uh, uh, object of class A. By the way, if you look carefully, it will even resemble you some patterns from Spring sometimes. Okay, so, and by in this code, in reality, it looks at the end, not that far away what you see in Spring-oriented codes. So, if you have, you know, if you are worried that you will have a lot of repetitive news, et cetera, if you don't use beans, no, actually not because if you have repetitions in code you can extract two methods you can even build hierarchies of objects use these factories providers and one thing though is visible if you have too many arguments in construction you that will be painful in one moment and in order to save yourself the, this pain you will actually be forced to split the class sooner or later into two and that's not a bad thing uh, Mm, okay, mm, because so now uh, this will actually keep your uh, architecture cleaner. By the way, here is my example. This is from hobby project, not from the real one, because you know real ones are always a little bit more messy. But how you, for instance, have something like a, a dependency injection and kind of module definition which defines which kinds of bins I'm instantiating here. And then I have, for instance, something for tests, etc., cetera, uh, like test model. Uh, in my, mm, let's say, this is more opinion and feeling because I was doing that for already a couple of years. Uh, uh, the difference is uh, that you, in you do manual dependency injection with constructor, you actually have more pain every day, like a little bit of pain every day. And you see that you add some feature and you need typically to split some classes. But this is a small pain. If you do that with container, you don't have pains for months, then actually you discover this class with 20 dependencies and that's too late. Splitting this class in half is really painful and dangerous. So you will not do that. And this class then will get even bigger because those are like monsters that keep growing. So that's how those the things dif differs. And at the end, I don't say that doing manual dependency injection automatically will make your architecture clean. Uh, reality is that we always get a spaghetti. I just say that in the end, it's typically this spaghetti gets messy a little bit later and keeps a better shape. It's easier to find the things out uh, because we don't have that many shortcuts there. Uh, by the way, I even hate more uh, specific kind of beans, uh, which are like request scoped, scoped session scoped, uh, anything that's thread local based, because those are even worse. I do say worse than global variables. Uh, I still remember one story uh, uh, I had where I had, let's say this is of course simplification. I had a method one with two arguments. Then inside there was like method two be called with argument A, method three be called with argument B. And the business came and said that we don't do method two anymore. We just don't call some service that's not needed. We, we simplify our actually business process. Okay, what can be done? We just remove this method to call, maybe even we remove this uh, argument a refactor code and then we get null pointer exception. On production, what has happened? Uh, because somewhere in method two, uh, someone, someone stored this argument a in a request show bin. And then later it was taken by, in fact, under the hood by some other, other inner uh, method uh, deeper in the stack trace and yeah, that's what, what is happening. So this is a really looks like a trolling uh, kind of coding, but it happens in reality. People are using this request scope bin or other, let's say not the crazy thread local based uh, scopes of bins and such things happen, especially for instance, if you use Spring Batch, which is by the way, really useful framework, but most of the applications I see using that, uh, those are very crazy in passing arguments under the hood. 
I don't know why, but it happens and makes any analysis of what's happening. If you want to just change something and rely on this in a later step, very, very tough. Okay. What is this? This basically means the local reasoning is broken. It means how much code do I have to analyze in order to solve my problem, to understand what's going on? If you rely on these beans and on those, uh, on, especially on those thread local base, then you have to look through a real lot of code sometimes, more than reasonable. And of course, uh, as, as I just said, sometimes you do small change that you are fully sure nothing can be broken, but then it breaks because of that. And by the way, tests are always green because people using beans learned to use mocks uh, a lot. And so at the end, what happens, they are testing mostly mocks. Yeah, that's the reality. And mocks are always working well. So I would say to you, please stop doing container injections. You don't have to stop doing at once all of them, but think about cleaning your architecture, cleaning your applications that you don't do it that, that often. Uh, there is another talk only about this aspect, like dependency, uh, deconstructing dependency injection by Tom Gabel, which is even getting deeper, how bad effects it has on our tests, etc. So, but I know that the other reason we have been is because we, in fact, want to have aspects, such a great aspects like transactional, which is my best annotation, uh, the most loved, uh, and because I've seen it not working on, I don't know how many, uh, how many times and for how many reasons, I will just uh, put you the most uh, common and easy to uh, explain or describe. Like, you know, obviously, that if you put transactional on a private method, it won't work. And who would do that? So no one probably, uh, maybe, if you do refactoring, someone will forget that it's in fact uh, uh, has a transactional annotation that does some changes and previously public method became private and wow, we don't have transactions anymore. Well, the effect of that is either a good effect is that nothing gets committed to the database, but worst thing is that we have something called auto commit. So if you have some kind of exception, we get with partially saved data in the database, which is then really great to in cleaning. Uh, the other thing which is even more funny, uh, uh, I would say, have you ever heard that if you call the same method from, from the bin, uh, method from the same bin inside of this bin, the most of the time, because this here it's uh, a star, it depends, also annotations wouldn't work like transactional, which is really great because this is something that's even hard to spot sometimes. Uh, this is again looks like crazy because someone created bin with new and people even are right now afraid of using new as if this was something wrong. It's nothing wrong with new. It's actually the thing that is wrong is those aspects and bins. But you know, it, sometimes it really happens. And uh, the worst thing is that it doesn't really instantly fail. It might fail later in some specific scenario. Uh, or, you know, with the year 2020, people now get uh, computers with uh, 16, 30 or more cores, and they start to use those cores, and they use multi-threading a lot, way more than before. And then they learn that if you do that inside of any of these bean-oriented platforms, it actually might not work. Uh, here is, again, it depends, but it's, it's a tricky thing. And uh, something that I thought it's always like, uh, this is only a joke and never happened, but yeah, happened uh, a year ago, almost exactly a year ago to me, I was analyzing an application where transactional didn't really work, even though everything was written okay. And then I really realized that someone has written all annotation, which was called transactional, just to make it more funny. Uh, but it was actually implementing transactional in a so funny way that that basically didn't work. Obviously, it was easy to see that it was uh, from a different package, but how often do you see that it comes from different package? And by the way, you can do it even though those developers were not as much trolling. Uh, I know that they, in fact, wanted to achieve something good that wasn't, that wasn't actually evil doing. That was just lack of knowledge. But you can do any your own uh, annotation that would be even maybe called uh, completely like harmless, but it can potentially break transactions, yeah? 
that made happen. And one, the worst thing that is actually uh, complex to explain, I once written that on the four programmers, just one small missing jar on server makes the transactions doesn't work and you will never notice. And that's really fun, oh, unless you see the broken data in the, in the database. The problem is that transactional isn't even the worst thing because worse are JPA, which are kind of, uh, let's say, entities there are just yet another type of beans, a little bit different this time. Uh, but the worst thing about them is that we have them in a managed or detached state. And sometimes the, in order to know uh, that you are doing something good or not, you have to find out if the object you are working on is attached to session or not. This is really crazy. So, um, I, I, because that's again broken local reasoning, how much code do you have to check to find this out? And after refactoring, it typically changes. Think of it that someone changes something in an object that is managed and then no matter if you actually at the end put some safe or something, it might be stored into the database even though you don't wanna do it. And there are more problems. Uh, something completely not associated with uh, Spring or any Java is actually that the databases, are, SQL databases are in fact more complex than some people know, some most developers know. We have uh, this transaction isolation level problem that sometimes really happen. It's very rare, you might have this once every three or four years, but then if you have transaction isolation level issues, um, by the way, it means simply that in most uh, applic uh, applications, the isolation between transactions isn't perfect because of performance. But if this kind of a thing happens, and on top of that, you have transactional annotations and JPA, the analysis of what has happened on production is sometimes basically not even feasible. By the way, if transactional doesn't work, it's funny where do you have to put a breakpoint in your code to find what's get wrong. And I can tell you that sometimes putting it even in a spring code all around of aspect doesn't help you at all because the thing happened during the initialization phase of a spring context and you basically have to start with how and debug how the spring is starting, which is cool because again, this is now uh, uh, local reasoning is even broke, uh, broken to the point that you have to analyze third party code and far away from the place where the problem happens. Okay, so uh, if you are not scared enough, I can tell you that same problems will happen with any security related annotations, cache, etc., cetera, lock. And uh, they have basically the same problems, just uh, it happens less often when, than with transactional, okay, at least I've seen it uh, less often, but think of it, you have a product, a web service that relies on the roles allowed to control access. And then because of us, after small refactoring, something like that doesn't work. And you, it's even hard to spot. Isn't that really great? A lot of developers say to me that mm, they actually don't see that many problems. Yes, I told you about my little bit different perspective, but what I've also observed, and that was uh, something I discovered uh, in last two years, that most of the developers uh, do it like that. They have these problems. They do have those problems. People do have, so, whole teams have problems. But then they just switch random lines, rewrite things, put random lines from Stack Overflow, and it works. And they commit it to production and never ask what was wrong and never go back to the problem. And so next week happens the same story. And again and again, you, it seems that that's no problem. Stack Overflow put some random lines, swap to other random lines, it's okay. Yep. By the way, uh, it's again because a lot of annotation related problems can be, uh, so aspect related problems in fact can be fixed by putting even more annotations. So my favorite one here is no repository bin. Just think of them for a moment. In Spring we have a notation which is called no repository bin. Uh, it's actually not that you have to mark all the classes that are not repository beans with this annotation, but sometimes you have to mark one or two interfaces, which is crazy. Uh, so at the end, it looks simple from, on the, you know, from the surface, but when you get into the details, it is really, really tough knowledge. You have to read all those books, and by the way, those are outdated. You have to read uh, new ones, and, and that's really funny or not. The reality also is that that's actually a year ago, uh, last year, so 2019, a few times I asked developers, 
why did you put this annotation here? Because I started to be really like angry when I've seen that something makes absolutely no sense in this context, but still someone put some annotation. And then I realized that most of the time the answer is it's just copied from other place. I don't know what it does, but it seems to work there. So it's similar to my solution. I just do it. That's how the magic is born, because now we rely on some magic. And by the way, uh, we sometimes use different definitions of magic. A lot of people think uh, make, uh, magic is something they don't understand. They don't want to, un want to understand. They rely on it, but they don't want to know how it works. It's just there. It's too complex to get into. Uh, I use uh, a little bit different definition, uh, uh, let's say inspired by John the Ghost. It's basically the things that do not compose safely. So if you look one, if you take a piece of code that relies on magic, you might make it working, but putting it together with something else might actually break it on a very crazy ways. So this is the definition from John the Ghost, but basically uh, magic on the JVM is caused by those things, especially first three ones, dynamic proxy thread local runtime reflection. If you have never heard about dynamic proxy and thread local and uh, you are doing Spring or Java EE related development, please read about it. You will understand a little bit how your tool works and you will be more aware what's, how can all this fail. By the way, now some funny mm, uh, case, of non how the things compose badly. Uh, indeed, there is a module in Spring that provides you this annotation, retryable, which is working. What it does, it's easy to imagine. It retries the method, uh, tries again, if something like exception happens. So you can even put how many times, like maximum three times. But let's say it's like this. And obviously, we have this transactional annotation, which makes things in transaction. Suppose we put both of them. And now comes exception inside of this. Do we have transaction inside every retry? So like we try each time with new commit and uh, rollback, or do we have one big transaction with, uh, and then couple of retries inside? And it's really crazy how much documentation, and in fact, in my case, how much code of Spring I had to read in order to find it out. By the way, this is a little bit uh, artificial case. I didn't have this on production, but think about cache and security. Most of the, by the way, uh, it is that mostly it behaves correctly. So if you check security for like, I don't know, admin, uh, things will get cached, <laughs> but will not have this thing displayed typically for a, let's say, not allowed user because cache works first. It's actually, there is a kind of order there, but getting into details, if you want to be sure, is very time consuming, surprising. So that's the problem because at the end we have some kind of a hidden cost. I told you most of the developers and teams do not really see this because they accept it as a grant that we have those crazy production bugs like every two months. We have post developments because for couple of days and in the extreme case I've seen a couple of months the team cannot work because data disappears from database and no one can find out why. We have tests that do not really test everything because they are testing uh, to be fast they are not really creating a spring context they, they are not really working with aspects yeah cool we are testing the only clean business logic but uh, then it happens that on the production we don't have a transaction. Or we have slow tests with aspects, which are especially slow if you use Java E. Uh, but hmm, then, uh, yeah, who, how many such tests do you have? And how often do you call them? Uh, even the like the first thing uh, working with beans is like something uh, most of you probably have seen over mocking. I call it really nasty masturbation. Like you mock tons of things, and at the end, the only thing you test is a mojito framework, for instance, not your really business logic. And then you have fear of refactoring, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, how we define aspects is also interesting because here we had a Java with type safety, but if you, in, in, you do your own aspects, you are totally dynamic. You get something that is object, you people do instance of all that stuff that we should do, do really. Uh, uh, 
Of course, we don't really do own annotations on aspect that often, so this problem is not that huge, but look at this code. This is, obviously, this is very, very simplified. Think that we can write it a little bit different without runtime aspect. This is a method that takes supplier and does it inside transaction. Now there is no magic anymore. You just call it doing transaction with Lambda, the parameter, and you have the same behavior which now can be composed. Okay, the star is, uh, sometimes it's not that easy. By the way, here's a better version when actually we call with, not with supplier, but we pass transaction connection or something else, like even entity context uh, to the function. Again, to the lambda. That's really pull pattern and you don't really even have to write it uh, in JOQ library. This is written for you. In some other libraries, this is written. Depends what, are you, what you are using. I think even in Hibernate, there was such a method. So just do something inside transaction and do define Lambda. Now no magic, no magic is needed anymore. And by the way, this even works in uh, various threads. Uh, if you jump from thread to thread, which is crazy. Uh, so one thing here, uh, I can tell you that almost all the aspects you can rewrite to functional way, but some of them mm, are not that cool. Like all the diagnostic or metrics, I realized while rewriting the metrics like uh, security or something uh, that the metrics like how long the method uh, works uh, puts things automatic into the labs. This is actually cool if it's done with reflection, so it doesn't mess in our code. This is the small place where I see uh, Spring on a cloud actually shines. This is something I don't have uh, at the moment better alternative. Yeah, for this aspect. So I have alternative, but it's not as beautifully simple. Uh, and by the way, the, this code of metrics is not that critical, so if it doesn't work, uh, no instant harm on production will happen. You just have not working metrics, which probably you will see. Okay. Uh, what? Uh, so what I wanted to show you, we don't really need beans that often. Let's say that often here. We don't really need aspect as, or as often as we use in code, as I see in application. So the question is, does this spring really useful at all? To my surprise, uh, I think that was like at the beginning on spring five, even before I realized that the solution to that is, is already provided by the spring team and it's called spring web flux. A little bit different spring web flux that most of you know, because spring web flux, if you haven't heard about it, can be used totally without beans in a totally functional way. Uh, unfortunately, the description how to do that is not as popular documentation and uh, you have to be more careful, but it's, uh, I have some of services working exactly with Spring Webflux without Spring Context and all this magic. And it works, it works beautifully. I do love this framework. Uh, this is, by the way, non-blocking framework, so potentially uh, uh, really can handle a lot of load. I don't have such, uh, a, such a case on production, but the tests really confirm that. It's fully functional. It has nice API, nice for instance, compared to other similar frameworks. I say similar, so functional non-blocking uh, frameworks like Ratpack. Uh, Spring really made it, uh, took some experience from the previous uh, projects and made it better. And really you don't need beans. However, you can use beans. Uh, if you need, so you can glue it with a classic spring, which seems to be a, for me to be a, a bit, big magic, even bigger, but it works. So it's uh, nothing like all, all or nothing. It's actually the solution. You can start with that. If you see that for some reason that you need classic spring, there is always a way to that. You don't have to change drastically your code. You, basically, you don't have to do nothing, anything special. Uh, one great thing about uh, uh, Spring team is that they always care about testability and they do provide great testing frameworks for, for instance, for Spring uh, basically and for Spring Web Flux. This really shines because it starts very fast. There is no class, span, class path, um, uh, scanning, all, the, all that stuff. So it really works. You have end to end tests on a REST layer like HTTP, which do really work fast. Okay. Uh, one thing about though is that if you do it really functional with React Reactor, uh, so really non-blocking, then it, it's really different way of doing uh, REST services. You have to learn that. By the way, you don't have to do this this way because exactly recently Spring for Webflux fully supports blocking way as well. 
I'm not using that, so I don't have much experience with this approach. Uh, uh, to my surprise, more Spring modules can be, in fact, used this way. Uh, so in a clean without Spring Beans, I never seen official statement that it's uh, by design like that. I once talked uh, to you, Jürgen Heller, that it's actually, let's say, they try it this way, but it's, let's say, not official goal as far as I know. Uh, so even a crazy thing, you can use Spring Data, which is itself very magic, but I, I in fact, use it without Spring context as well. Uh, uh, so, actually, I hope I've shown you uh, that Spring can still be good uh, without beans, and I'm do I'm really satisfied with it on production. I like it, uh, especially that it's uh, easy easy to convince uh, architects because I'm still using uh, architects of a customer that I'm still using Spring. Why would you worry? Yeah? So. Uh, one thing about Java E, I really liked it for being well documented, consistent framework for year 2000. And then it started to be nicer for a lot of people, even I liked, liked it, the changes, but it became more bean oriented and more like springy than spring. Uh, right now, if you want to see really crazy projects with full of annotations like post construct just think there is a post construct which says this is a method that should be called after construction so it means also that constructor doesn't really work doesn't do his job you have to fix something later you will see that only in java e projects uh, good thing is maybe that in the meantime last uh, five years almost all java e servers can be now working as embedded which fixes some problem and so do not use standalone application servers. That's basically no, there is no sense to do that. Make jar no wall, <laughs> make jar not ear. Okay, ear is even old story, I hope for you. So uh, uh, you need containers, there are other solutions than application server. Uh, there is something I called uh, for Java E. If I am forced, and I was forced in the past to write Java E projects to be deployed on server or to run with uh, Java E, then I, uh, something I called Vidmushka actually in Poland. I think there is probably an official name for this pattern, like kind of facade, but I call, let's say, uh, this is very easy to uh, demonstrate. I separate my clean code, just plain Java, my libraries, not a framework like Java E or Spring, by the way, the same works for Spring. And I separate it like as a core and maybe multiple modules. All of them are clean Java, no framework code there, no, not even annotations and uh, no beans. And then I have only a wrapper like JAXRS, Spring Controller, uh, with injections like data sources, etc. So example here, this is my top level. But in fact, internally, what's important, this order service, it is a clean Java. I pass Entity Manager as a dependency there, and I do it. <coughs> I did it with a team a few years ago. That was mostly, let's say, that wasn't even my idea. But I realized how much better became this project. That's hence I learned this approach and I started to question usability of all those beans. Uh, some patterns, of course, for Spring, and that's also you can use so classic Spring MVC and again on the facade, on the controllers in Spring and the rest clean way. This is, this is feasible that actually works well, at least for a couple of teams I've seen. So, uh, by the way, I, if you look at the initial idea, what was uh, Jakarta e, Java e created for, it's really we went far from this. Like it should be doing remoting distributed transaction. That's really a core feature of uh, Java e. And who is now doing <laughs> Java e for distributed transactions? So it means that hmm, this, this framework is really something wrong happened. And I really question its usability. And it's actually in the business slowly. I even call it sometimes really nasty zombie uh, or like it's, Still working, it's still moving, but it smells a little bit. Yeah. So solutions for you, maybe now. Now let's go to the uh, how to get out of the hole uh, with small steps. If you are your whole life with was was with Spring or Java E, and you don't see other life, then do small steps. First, think about dropping application servers. Then uh, uh, think about. Uh, mm, Making jar or not work, that's the, basically the same. Spring Boot is actually good for this step, so do it like this. A step two, and that's my most important message for today. Hold your beans. Not everything in your application has to be bean. That's, that's how you benefit the most. 
use use beans where framework forces you and maybe where you, you really need this shortcut but only the try to not do it at all yeah so exactly like jack jack's rest annotations controllers okay i don't have problem with that but yeah then the rest just constructor and manual dependency injection it works great uh, fun starts on the next point if you are using only jpa you will see how much actually in the long run is better to use Juke or Query DSL, which is not really now really maintained project, but still works. JDBI, which is a little bit better, JDBC. Again, uh, in fact, useful. You can see it as a primitive compared to JPA, but on the long run, it uh, it's causes let, uh, less headaches. And step four is the alternatives, not only for persistence, but for web REST frameworks. You have never had, never seen, See how beautifully simple are especially frameworks like Spark, Java, Java, Insta, even libraries, we can call them. Those are not frameworks. OK, so uh, the last step that uh, many people are doing, I am doing, I don't recommend doing it right now, is try functional programming. programming. Transaction is, in fact, a monad. And uh, that's a really crazy thing. So that's a transaction as a monad. Uh, uh, I am even working on my hobby project or changing, uh, let's say, all of this exactly spring annotations into uh, into effects uh, on a monad. This is something I, I don't say, don't do that because this is experimental. I try to mimic exactly spring behavior with functional behavior, exactly this. No one does it because typically pe people say, see that they don't really need to mimic spring, but I am doing that as, as, a, as a hobby uh, exercise. So my opinion, spring is battle tested has great docs. No one was fired probably for choosing Spring. Uh, if you choose alternatives, you will see, for instance, that documentation is worse. Less people will use it. Every developer, uh, one thing, people say that, oh, we have hundreds of Spring developers, so we should go with Spring. But the problem is most of those developers, and uh, check that after this talk, no Spring only after shallow level. They get into pitfalls constantly. They, they just don't realize. Uh, so because they are not even aware of this complexity. And, but I have, as I've shown, we can still use those uh, platforms. When we minimize use of beans, though, became actually productive and not that crazy in use. So want to know more, uh, I like a couple of talks, like from Adam Varsky, 2017, the case against annotations, Tamar Gabel's lying sacred cows. Uh, cool, from Spring Boot to Functional Kotlin by Nicholas Frankel. You will, I think you will hear him in a, a couple of minutes. This is about, uh, as far as I remember, Spring uh, Kofu project. So Spring is experimenting to be even more, less crazy, in my opinion. So it is an experiment, but it looks, it goes into the good direction, not fully as I want it to be, but it's still, so it's like next generation Spring boot will be even better from, let's say, uh, clean and functional perspective. Here. Okay, that's all for now. I don't know, I, I ran out of time. I don't know if there are any questions.